Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Almost a million people have been trafficked across the Mediterranean Sea to Europe in 2015 alone, while an estimated 25,000 people have disappeared or died in the last decade after their vessels sank somewhere between Africa and Europe. As EU nations struggle to cope with a historic wave of migration via perilous land and sea routes, the ruthless trafficking of human cargo across the Mediterranean risks turning these crystalline waters, once the playground for the rich and famous, into a cemetery at sea. Lampedusa, the southernmost point of Europe, just 70 kilometers from the shores of Africa. Kos, one of the Greek islands, just five kilometers from Turkey. Lesbos, even closer to Turkey. These beautiful, barren islands in the Mediterranean Sea are like life rafts for hundreds of thousands of men, women and children caught up in an epic human migration. My experience in this sector brings me to say that surely we need a collaboration of all European nations because we find ourselves in front of a phenomenon that is of biblical proportions. Some of them were trafficked, um, some of them were very mistreated along the way. They've told us of being beaten by traffickers for asking for water, of seeing others who didn't make the journey, who died on the way. In 10 years, 20 years, when they write the history of this period we are living, they will say we are responsible for a genocide. The refugee tragedy and trafficking that began in the Strait of Sicily has spread eastward across the southern Mediterranean as desperate millions flee conflict and violence in the Middle East, North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. Each asylum seeker has a unique story, but nearly all have the same goal. I had to find a way to save my life. So I have to save my dear life. We take a risk to reach, you know, to the safe life. I come to Syria and to Turkey to save my life and my family life, my children's life. We just hope for safe life. They make dangerous crossings in flimsy boats from Tunisia, Egypt, Libya and Turkey, landing during the night or at dawn, exhausted but overjoyed to have reached the European Union. The mass migration across the Mediterranean in the years since the Arab Spring in 2011 has presented Europe with a moral and political dilemma that threatens to tear the Union apart. Deep rifts have emerged between nations about how to manage the wave of arrivals, and there is no agreement on common asylum policy. Some are building walls to keep people out. Others are building camps to keep people in. One of the founding principles of the EU, free movement between borders, has been repeatedly violated by the closing of frontiers. Where did it all start? The Mediterranean was a flashpoint for migration even back in the 1990s, after the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe, when ships carrying thousands of Albanians fleeing economic and social unrest pulled into Italy's eastern ports. Then, in the early 2000s, migrant boats began arriving on the shores of Sicily. Here at Donna Lucata, a dozen migrants drowned in a 2003 wreck that shocked the small community. The victims lie in unmarked graves, 
in the peaceful Sicilian cemetery of Scicli. The tragedy was repeated again in 2005 and again in 2009. They were rare landings at the time, but only a glimpse of what was yet to come after the world radically changed in 2011. The world watched as the Arab Spring began in Tunisia in February 2011 and was followed by unrest in Egypt and Syria. Then, in September 2011, a bloody civil war erupted in Libya, NATO air power toppling Muammar Gaddafi. Instability across North Africa triggered a flood of landings. Lampedusa was on the front lines of an emergency that would spread across the entire Mediterranean basin. March 2011. Boatloads of people began arriving in rickety fishing vessels from Tunisia. Within weeks, the population of migrants had surpassed the number of inhabitants on the island. Giacomo had just started Radio Delta, the island's only radio station. Live from the studios of Radio Delta, good morning to all of you radio listeners, or sha. In 2011, Lampedusa found itself hosting 10 to 11,000 migrants, and they were here for 45 days, camped out everywhere. There was even a place that was named the Hill of Shame, which is just over there, just beyond the port. And we found ourselves witness to a terrifying scenario. These people didn't even have toilets or a place for their personal hygiene. They were living in the streets, living on the beaches, living on the famous Hill of Shame by the ports. They were living in whatever they could find, overturned boats, boxes. I remember in the period, which was around March, it was one of the coldest years in the history of Lampedusa. They suffered a lot. The locals on Lampedusa generously opened their homes to help. There were people cooking at midday and in the evening. The centre was overflowing and they brought the meals to where they were living, to the beaches, to the maritime station, but they were simply too many. But the tiny 30 square kilometre island of Lampedusa with its 6,000 inhabitants simply couldn't cope. Tensions boiled over, with migrants setting fire to the overcrowded reception center. Those who worked inside the camp at the time had survived a previous arson attack two years before. It was pure madness. The fire started and you couldn't see anything because there was black smoke coming out everywhere. And we saw these flames getting higher and higher in a terrifying way. The air had become unbreathable. So we all started running out and we got out intoxicated by the smoke and fumes, but we made it. Then, in 2011, there was another one. Camp conditions in Lampedusa were harsh, with months to wait in overcrowded facilities and no means of releasing the growing tensions as migrants demanded the right to move on. Surely these people, who were closed in there for three months without even a television and their only outlet was a soccer ball, these people eventually lost it. It was like living in an episode of Big Brother, exactly like that. The government was finally forced to respond and sent ferries to take some people off the island. This was just a first wave of migration across the southern central Mediterranean and was to be followed by tragedies and tensions of increasing magnitude. 
Over the four years since the Arab Spring mass arrivals, new routes have developed via Greece and the Balkans. After the fatigue of hundreds of kilometers of travel, followed by the terror of a sea crossing, comes the frustration of confusing European bureaucracy. The chaos and waiting that migrants endure once they arrive in Europe created flashpoints across the Mediterranean. Till now, there is no solution for Syrians. They said, we are sorry, Syrians have to wait, have to wait. While Syrians fleeing civil war are often allowed to move on quickly, Africans and South Asians can languish for years as the bureaucracy runs its course. For me I spent one year, four months. When you, you have to wait for one year. I don't know, I don't know anything. I don't know anything. I don't know if there's a problem, come and tell me. You know what problem, what problem. The captains are partis, we are here. Emiliano Abramo offers support to migrants in the Sicilian reception centers through the Sant'Egidio Catholic Charity. These long waits, a year and a half, sometimes two years, bring a migrant to suffer this situation a lot. They aren't able to explain what an asylum request is, that they are in a reception center and cannot work, that they did not become rich like maybe the family believes they did. So often, even these ties are broken. They lived a tragedy before even arriving at the ports of Palermo or other Sicilian cities. And then they have to wait years, a year, a year and a half, just to have the right to stay in Europe. Only some of the migrants are allowed to stay in Europe. Some are expatriated. Some escape, or worse. If the asylum request is positive, they start a new story. But if the request is negative, it is truly a drama. A drama to the point that last month, a 29-year-old Pakistani hung himself when he found out that the outcome of his request was negative and his trip had been meaningless. In 2013, Pope Francis visited Lampedusa to show solidarity to the island and refugees seeking safe haven there. But sadly, his pleas for a solution fell on deaf ears in Europe. Only a few months later, a tragedy struck that would change the migrant flow drastically. The boat people come during the summer months with the calm seas. Until 2014, their target was the tiny Italian island of Lampedusa, which lies only 113 kilometers from North Africa. This white, sandy beach was declared the most beautiful in the world shortly before, just a few meters away, a migrant boat capsized. 366 men, women and children drowned. We were hanging out with friends. We heard about this huge mess that had happened, this huge apocalypse. So we all went down to the Rabbit Island beach because we had heard it happened near there. There was a lot of action there, helicopters overhead and rescue boats everywhere. You can only imagine how the people were feeling. A boat of three Lampedusan fishermen first came to the rescue. I looked through the binoculars and see all these people in the sea. You could see only heads. When we got there, it was a tragedy. All these people in the sea, screaming, yelling help. We started picking up people who were in the sea. It was hard work, because they were greasy from the fuel oil. They slipped. Picking up a person was dying. It's a heavy burden. The news spread very fast. The islanders were shocked, and all the people came down to the port and the beaches. It was hard. Some we helped with ropes, some we helped with ladders. There was a girl. She was one meter ninety, very robust. I had to put her on the stern, tie a rope around her, 
and pull her up with a rope. Because who could have lifted that girl? She was rocking back and forth from head to foot. She was near death, exhausted to the point of not being able to go on. We pulled 18 people out, including two who were already dead, unfortunately. We could do no more than that. By the time the Coast Guard arrived, there was little that could be done. The wooden fishing vessel with 366 aboard had sunk to 20 meters under the sea with its tragic cargo of desperation. In the days that followed, police, Coast Guard and fire brigade divers recovered the bodies. Dr. Pietro Bartolo is the only coroner on the island and examined every single body to establish cause of death. On the stern of the fishing boat, there were four dead bodies. Of those, three were for sure dead because they were in rigor mortis. And then there was this young girl who was spread out on the net on the stern. And I took her pulse and thought I felt a faint heartbeat. I listened again and in fact I could hear a heartbeat. She was alive. So we rushed her in the ambulance and resuscitated her for more than an hour. And finally she recovered. It was just saving one, a small thing, but still it was a great thing that gave us enormous satisfaction. Hundreds of others were not so lucky. Coast Guard boats came in hour after hour with bodies. Then we had to manage a continuous arrival of body after body after body. Among the dead of this tragedy, there were many children, there were pregnant women, the anger? The anger was that this happened on a day when there was beautiful weather and just a few hundred meters from the port. They had arrived. It would have taken just a few more minutes and they would have been safe. In fact, they had already prepared all the children. They were all dressed up. And doing the inspection, I noticed this thing because they were about to land somewhere new, so they were all dressed up in a dignified way. And that really struck me, to see all these little children, all with their best clothes on. Well, it really hurt me. All the bodies remained there until they were loaded onto the ships and taken to Agrigento, where they finally had their dignified burial. In the new cemetery of Agrigento, as in dozens of other cemeteries scattered across Sicily, the unnamed migrants are buried as numbers. The government decided to take action. The then Prime Minister, Enrico Letta, ordered the Coast Guard and the Navy to send out patrols deep into international waters close to Libya to intercept the boats. The operation was called Mare Nostrum. It saved lives, but now the traffickers could save money on fuel, knowing that the Italian government would pay for the migrants' onward journey. Palermo. Here in the bustling heart of the gritty Sicilian capital, Italian prosecutor Maurizio Scalia opened an investigation into the Lampedusa disaster. We began a series of activity with wiretaps, using telephone numbers of these subjects. The Palermo prosecutor's office became the hub of an Italy-wide investigation into the network of smugglers trafficking migrants across the Mediterranean and onwards towards the north. 
We heard live the organizer of this trip, where 366 people died, who in some way confessed during the course of a conversation with another trafficker to have organized that trip. From there, bit by bit, we exposed this network of traffickers. In Libya, we identified the two biggest traffickers, and we even managed to get an arrest warrant from the judge. But evidently, the political situation in Libya is very unstable, so we were not able to carry out the arrests. As investigators found out the hard way, exposing the network is one thing, destroying it is another. But who are the migrants and where do they come from? Why do they leave? Most are fleeing violence, terrorism, religious conflict and war. Unfortunately, the rebellion there, I decided to leave Casamas because I cannot go back to Gambia. So I decided to take this journey. They are fighting in Nigeria also to, tell, to, tell, to ask me to do what is not under my religion because I'm a Christian. I have a problem because my father is a politician and uh, he got himself into one mess or the other because of politics. So my family, generally, no one is at home now and my father is dead because of the same issue. Et la population voulait manifester, eh bien, ils ont, ils ont euh, arrêté la population de ne pas à, à se manifester. Et ces jours-là, ils ont commencé porte à porte, ils ont fait, et, il, y avait, il y avait des morts et plusieurs blessures. Et ils m'ont poursuivi, ils m'ont même tiré, j'ai reçu le bal. Ouais. The wars in Syria, Afghanistan and Iraq have displaced millions mostly to Lebanon and Turkey. More than 700,000 people have taken to the narrow straits that separate Turkey from Greece. They then continue up the Balkan route toward northern Europe. Go to market, you're afraid. Somebody will come take the boat and you enter inside the people and bomb it and kill the people. Small girls, small boy, uh, women, anything, men, uh, men for, for shops. Uh, what do you do? This, this kill and this kill. We're flooded you know, from the war. Assets, barrels and ISIS knives, terrorists. You don't have a choice when you go to the army. You have two choices. You have to choose one of them. You don't have any third option. Uh, you have to kill or to be killed. Others are fleeing famine and abject poverty. Abdul Lahab was kidnapped from Abidjan and sent to work in the mines of Mauritania, where his civil rights were denied for one simple reason. From there, he moved on to Mali, Niger, Libya. The sub-Saharan migrants are trafficked from one heartless smuggler to another, all the way up through Africa, including a dangerous journey through the Sahara Desert. Almost four to five days I'm in the desert before I reach Libya. So it was really a horrible journey, without no food, without no water. What I see in the desert, I don't think I will ever show that in my life again. Definitely. So many people died, so many people lost their life. Well, our car was robbed by the rebels in the desert. And uh, at the end, by God's grace, I was the only one that succeeded. The rest actually was saved later and returned back to Nigel. The trip is very long for migrants because from the country of origin to arrive at the Great Funnel, which is Libya, the location where a lot of migrants arrive to await their turn for the trip to Europe, every time there is a passage from one human trafficker to another, they are exploited. Then he told me that when we reach in, in Libya, then I have to walk. If I'm walking, I'll be walking under him 
until that money is completed. So I agree with him. Then he take me to he take me off with the with his group of people to Libya. Those who survive the Sahara are often imprisoned the moment they cross into Libya. I have no document. I was arrested by Libya soldiers. While I was going to Tripoli, I was caught by the soldier and taken to prison. They take me to prison. I have my passport because I have a paper of the death. I have my passport. But why did they even hide me during the night? I don't have food. I'm fine. You are like 35 people. I'm going to go to prison. The police usually ask for a document. And if you don't have a document, you go to prison. If you have a document, they ask for a stamp. And if you have a stamp, they rip out the page. And you go to prison anyway. Gadron, that's where I arrived. But when we arrived there, we went to prison straight. Then on our way to Tripoli, we got uh, uh, the soldiers on the checking point. Then they arrest us, ask us uh, for uh, documents. Then we say that we don't have anything. Then they take us from there to prison. It is the same story for most Africans, who once in Libya are imprisoned and then requisitioned by powerful locals to work as slaves. They cross kilometre after kilometre, impervious zones of the desert. They arrive finally in Libya, where for weeks and months they are subject to violence and harassment. What they ask from people is money. Then me, I have no one who to pay for that money for me. So in that prison, uh, because I was among the youngest, what I have to do is to clean the environment. I'll be there cleaning the environment, cleaning the environment, doing nonsense rubbish works there. I have to do it. I stayed there for three months in the prison. Then I was helped by one soldier. He said he have Lawaju. If he rescue me out of the prison, I will work for him. Then he will do my Libya document for me with the, the work I will be working for him. They needed me to do so many electrical work in that prison yard. I did it and they promised they will leave me. And so you become a slave. Often they are penned in with fences, like cattle. You'll be in torture, harassment, no food, or even if you have to eat, it will be once per day. So it's crazy. La deux mois on a fait prison par jour. On mange un peu. Il y a l'eau, il y a celle dedans. On boit ça. Même il y a les gens qui sont venus ensemble, sont malades à cause de l'eau, l'eau là. Even for the lucky ones who break out or work their way out from prison, Libya is lawless. No one is safe. In Libya, everybody is carrying gun. You don't know who is soldier, you don't know who is uh, individual man, you don't know who is civilian, you know. In Libya, all they are, they are all the same. He tried to conf confront them, but they are with guns. They decided to shoot him. Yes, yes. So it was like crazy. So, yes. And the brother, so unfortunately, he dies there. They are pushed out on rickety boats or rubber dinghies from the coasts of Egypt, Turkey, Libya. They are put out on boats and sent to die in the Mediterranean or try to reach Europe. For many, it is the first time they have ever seen the sea. And there is no turning back. What they told us already was that we are going to board ship. At the end, in the night when they took us to where we were pushed, we saw a different thing altogether. I haven't seen the sea, not on the sea, I haven't seen it with my eyes. Then he's saying that uh, the, the journey to, the, to Italy is a few, few hours to some minutes to journey. 
but there is no going back because once you get to there, to the seashore, they don't allow you to go away, they don't allow you to go back, they don't allow you to, to change your mind. You must enter. So we had to risk it. Entre la mort, si ça pèse devant sa soeur, on va mourir dans l'eau. Comme j'ai dit ça, il m'a attendu, il m'a giflé. Two people died in our own. We have already seen the rescuers. They threw a rope to us for us to hold it. But everybody wanted to save himself at a particular time. At the same time, you know, they fell into sea and uh, the water took them away. Sub-Saharan Africans make up the poorest segment of clientele for the traffickers, who often use them as ballast below deck. I opened the hold and went down and was walking on the dead. There were 25 corpses that had been closed in the hold just as ballast. In fact, some of them were beaten with sticks and during the inspections of the bodies I found broken bones and head wounds. So they closed them down there and they died there in a matter of minutes. The poorest black Africans, who are used as ballast on larger boats, often die from suffocation due to engine fumes or drown if the ship goes down. But on the top decks, traffickers pack the boat with higher paying passengers who have already paid for the trip. I sistemi di pagamento sono assolutamente primordiali, basati sulla fiducia. The payment systems are absolutely primordial, based on trust, known as the Havala method. And in fact, we can't get to the organization from a financial way. It is a patrimony that has a minimum risk for their investment. If there is a shipwreck, in any case, the money has already been deposited. Each leg of the journey has a price. 700 dinars. 1,300. 1,000 dollars. 2,000, 1,000 euro and uh, come by point uh, to coast. We determined that the trip from Eritrea to Libya is approximately $5,000. The trip from Libya to Italy is approximately $1,500 per migrant. And the successive steps from Sicily to the centre of Italy and toward North Europe costs approximately 2,000 euros. This Pakistani family paid 5,000 dinars for all of them to travel to Italy in 2015. And although the boat was rickety and the waves high, traveled on top. His wife was pregnant at the time of the crossing, and their young baby was born in the Mineo camp. This former NATO Air Force base is the largest reception center in Europe. But they are among the lucky ones. On the 18th of April 2015, a similar boat, carrying 700 people, capsized when it came in sight of a tanker that tried to rescue it. Sicilian fishermen from the port town of Mazzara del Vallo were in the area and were the first to arrive on the scene. There was everything there in the sea, clothing, objects, children's shoes even. But other than all the floating debris, we found nothing else. Just these four bodies and that's it. Hundreds drowned, but the boat captain was identified 
by the few who survived the traumatic incident after they were brought to the port of Catania. In general, it is usually the migrants themselves who indicate to the police who are the ones who were the captains of the boats, who are responsible for terrible crimes in the Sea of Lampedusa. For example, they throw in the sea those who protest, who are sick, the women who yell, or the children who cry. These seem like stories we hear from the concentration camps of Dachau and Auschwitz. Tensions with Libya are high, making any attempt to arrest traffickers impossible. The fishing community of Mazzara del Vallo is one of the largest in the Mediterranean, and the boats fish in international waters off the Libyan coast, where their nets get caught on sunken vessels and they risk being targeted by Libyan gangsters. Domenico has lost one of his ships to Libyan militias, but luckily was able to save the crew. They came with a small boat full of machine guns and hand grenades. They sequestered us and brought us to the port of Benghazi. And after a month, after various negotiations, we left from there with a boatload of money and we had to pay these militias, because otherwise they would not let us go. Recently, there was the phenomenon of the use of arms to recover the boat. After the Coast Guard ships have rescued the migrants, they get close to the traffickers' boats, shoot against our boats and try to recover the dinghy. The mobilization of European fleets now patrolling the waters off Libya will make it more difficult for the traffickers, who have been making huge profits for years. But perhaps the only way to effectively disrupt this lucrative market is to offer safe and low-cost passage, a humanitarian bridge. The Mediterranean Sea covers some two and a half million square kilometers from Spain to Israel. Nearly a million people crossed it by boat in 2015 to reach the shores of Europe, mainly via Italy and Greece. They transit through Turkey, Egypt, Libya, sometimes paying multiple smugglers along the way. Some are pushed directly out to sea. Others are taken to mother ships before being offloaded onto smaller boats near European waters. The crisis began with refugee and migrant arrivals in Italy. But where to next? Once on Italian shores, many choose to leave the reception centers and continue through Europe clandestinely. This is especially true of Eritreans, who make up 18% of the migrants. These are people passing through, the so-called invisibles, people who escape from the centers, pass by us to get something to eat and then come together to take a bus either to Rome or Milan before leaving Italy. Their objective is to reach other family members in Northern Europe. They continue north by bus, truck or train toward the Alps. Here in the fashion capital of Milan, they rest in the empty glass storefront designed for window shopping in the train station. They often rely on help from volunteers. But in the spring of 2015, the refugee crisis shifted eastwards, with nearly two million Syrian refugees in Turkey and another million in Lebanon beginning to migrate toward Europe via Greece and the Balkans. These are the narrow straits that separate Turkey from Greece. 
just a few kilometers. With a night of fine weather, the crossing is easy. It's simple, like everybody else. Uh, we get on the boat, uh, we, uh, we took the direction and we started the, the engine. That's all. It's simple. Every day, dozens of such boats land on the shores of the Greek islands close to Turkey. Here, on Lesbos, new arrivals strip off their soggy life jackets and then must walk 70 kilometers to this crowded reception center, where they must wait to be registered and wait some more before being allowed to leave for Athens. In the most crowded periods, migrants resorted to sleeping rough and sought shelter in the makeshift tent cities throughout the port. Accidents can be deadly, though, even in these benign waters. This image of a Turkish soldier carrying two-year-old Elan Kurdi on this tourist beach near Bodrum shocked the world. Since then, Dozens have drowned in these same waters. This is the remote Turkish beach on the Akiarla Peninsula where the boats leave from. Signs of recent activity are everywhere. During the day, men climb the mountainous promontory to prepare boats for the evening's activity. When the sun goes down on Bodrum, desperate refugees make their way up the dark, thorny paths here to the takeoff point. Jamal was a Sunni, an officer in the Iraqi army who had to flee. I work in the army Iraq, officer in the army Iraq, and that's danger for me to stay in Iraq because the militia is kill any, any person he work in the army, in less time he kill him. This is the beach where Jamal's children took a small boat on the night of September the 2nd, 2015, hoping to make the trip from Bodrum to Kos in an hour. When he come to go by boat, he, 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 this boat is small. He, maybe he, he, for 10 person, but he got with, with him 17 person in this boat. After they come, before they receive to cause, you have accident during in, during in the in the sea. Some people dead, some people swimming to another side, to Turkish side, and some people is lost. Three people lost. My children, with two children, he lost. He don't found anything in in Turkey. Others were more fortunate like these Syrians and Iraqis who had just landed at dawn on the 18th of September 2015. We see all the, the water is on the boat and we all, all the people we thinking we, we will be die. Just I want from the God to save all these people who came from Turkish. We want to be in the place safe. This is all we need. For those who do make it, the welcome on Kos is quite different from the reception they receive in Italy. This group has just been rescued by an Italian finance police vessel in the straits between Bodrum and Kos. They use their life jackets as mattresses and wash where they can. They are given no official information, but simply told to go to the Frontex office to be identified. First, you have to go to the Red Cross and take you know, uh, a ticket with number after a verification of your names, okay, your uh, documents, passports, or identity, or something like that, okay, and after that you will take you know, uh, the number. Then you go to the police. You will find them on the list of the police. Although these islands are part of the European Union, the fingerprinting is not recognized by the rest of Europe, 
and Greece refuses to give them refugee status. In Italy as well, migrants often will do anything to avoid being fingerprinted. The fact is, the adults, as well as the minors who come to us, they are escaping from the centers. They don't want the police to take their fingerprints, because they don't want that the bureaucratic process of the asylum request is started in Italy. It is an unspoken understanding in the southern Mediterranean. Greece and Italy don't want them. And most don't want to stay in Greece or Italy. If there is opportunity, in Italy I stay. If there is no opportunity, I find my way out. Uh, I think uh, we will go to uh, Germany. I would like to go to Austria. Or stay in Austria, I'll go to Finland or Sweden, any, people, any place. My children, when I, I lost him, he want to go to Germany to play football, because he plays football. International volunteers have arrived on Greek and Italian islands to try to help. One group, MOAS, even chartered their own rescue yacht and staffed it with Médecins Sans Frontières. But the sheer scale of the crisis is overwhelming. We start in the morning with breakfast. We take care of personal hygiene issues and then do the distribution of clothes, which we collect from private citizens. Um, well, in the morning then we go uh, along the coastline and give them like dry clothes, some water, some like food, because they are hungry and thirsty. Um, and then at 11.30 we go to the police station and most of the men are waiting there uh, to register themselves and we give some water and a fruit, like an apple or an orange. Migrants from Africa sometimes arrive barefoot, then are checked for scabies and infectious diseases at the Italian ports where they arrived. On Kos and Lesbos, these Syrian and Iraqi families arrived well-dressed and ready to continue their voyage north. But in both Italy and Greece, New arrivals are supposed to receive authorization and their paperwork before moving on. On COS, the names of the fortunate few who have been authorized appear on a list that is posted on this board every morning, which the refugees examine attentively, searching for their names. The queues in front of the police station are long and tempers flare as conditions are harsh. <laughs> Abandoned hotels often become a home from home for migrants seeking shelter. On Kos, they flocked to the Captain Elias on the outskirts of town. When local authorities closed it due to squalid conditions, migrants were forced out onto the streets. They began living in tents near the police station and in the park until their papers were ready. The park became known as the jungle. Then they went to a park known as the jungle. That is where they live, mostly sleeping on the ground or sometimes on cardboard boxes. And the Syrian families, when they arrive, they often get rooms in the hotels, usually for 15 euros a night. And it is this way that pristine beachfront destinations across the Mediterranean, once reserved for wealthy tourists, have become the starting point of the most desperate, epic migration crisis Europe has undergone since World War II. When the vital paperwork comes through at last, refugees can move on to the next phase of their long march about 24 hours to Macedonia, then maybe 7 to 10 hours to Serbia. Then we get the Hungarian borders, the most difficult border. And there is the problem and the hardest, hardest part of the journey. While Syrians are financially better off and can find places on the ferries that carry refugees to the continent, the drama of less fortunate migrants often leaves them vulnerable. This young man traveled on foot and by bus from Pakistan to Istanbul. 100 Pakistan. 
in road sleeping. He paid $1,000 to go to Greece, but was told by smugglers he could not continue because priority was being given to Syrians. You are not coming to Akialar. Ne? You are Pakistani. Ne Pakistani joke. No? Pakistani money where you? Yo. Send yo. Now he's out of money and is stuck at the Bodrum bus station. This is his bed. Investigators say a growing concern is that smugglers' networks extend into the heartland of Europe. In general, when they arrive in Italy, the migrants already have the cell of the trafficker who is going to take care of their trip to central or north Italy and then into north Europe. They contact them and sometimes have them escape from the reception centers. Organized crime is also finding ways to profit from lethal trafficking of human cargo. One infamous mob boss in Rome even boasted that migrants were a more lucrative trade than drugs. The profitable contracts for running reception centers are a low-risk, high-profit business. Children traveling alone are among the most vulnerable. Sometimes they fall prey to prostitution or organ harvesting rings. The lucky ones are taken in by state welfare or charity organizations. There is certainly a torbid network of trafficking of children's organs who are taken and used by these death merchants and then only later taken on to the second reception, the so-called second reception. These teenagers have been through so much um, to be so young. Uh, one teenager I spoke to, he talked about just wanting a home, a place that his mother and his brother and he could live. Unfortunately, they were separated. Uh, when he left, there was fighting. They, he had to run for his life. He doesn't know if his mother and his brother are alive. But we just spoke and he talked about craving that, of having a home that they could live in together. Others want to rejoin their family, to just be able to call them to have a settled life. It's, it's a very basic um, set of needs that people want because they've been away from home. You have to keep in mind it's not just weeks. In some cases it's months, it's maybe two years. We had various minors who asked us for first aid or sanitary help because they had scabies or dermatological problems. We offered to take them to the hospital, but they refused because they don't want to be identified. The families who are fleeing Syria have seen incredible amounts of violence. Um, the children who lived in Syria have uh, seen people shot, have seen, you know, often been the victims of violence directly themselves. So as that conflict has gone on for more than four years, uh, you see that people have been through these very traumatic experiences, even young children, the pictures they draw. It shows what's pushing them out of Syria into neighboring countries, but also to make such a long journey. Although introducing illegal immigrants into the European Union is a crime, punishable with jail sentences, where there is demand, market forces are insurmountable, making the crisis unlikely to wane until stability is achieved in the countries of origin. There is no choice, mister, there is no choice. Even if you die you know, under you know, barrels, okay, or terrorist attacks, or you know, cross the sea with its dangers to go to the safe land. When I go for a walk before 2006 with my brother and my father, some people come in two motors and you slay me and my brother. My brother, you take five uh, gun, five shooter, and me one. Yeah, but God, you keep me and my brother and know and remain for life. This is my life and my country. The men, women and children who leave conflict-torn areas of Africa, Asia and the Middle East for Europe certainly do not risk their lives for purely economic reasons. Every one has a compelling reason to leave their homeland to find safety elsewhere and risk losing their lives along the way. When you go to Italy, you have freedom forever. When you die in Libya, you die. When you stay in Libya, no more freedom. Because Libya, today negative, tomorrow positive. When you are here, you might die. When you are here, you might succeed. 
But when you go to Europe, you will succeed forever. If you succeed in maintenance, you are free forever. I don't have a choice. Because here, once what is important to me is not everything but my dear life. But here, I can tell you that uh, I'm safe. When there is life, there is hope. For today, I'm alive, so I still get hope. You just want some countries to deal with other options, just to avoid themselves this danger, because nobody cares if you died or not. Here is a solution, you can save our lives. Unless the international community acts soon to provide safe passage for refugees and prevent lethal trafficking of human cargo, thousands more will die, taking their hopes and dreams with them to the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. Yeah.